on this, the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. You might be wondering what's going on with all of these mirrors. And I would like to tell you, but I don't want to spoil it because these mirrors will be a part of the sermon later in our worship. But as you are building your worship space this morning, you might want to have a candle lit uh, as a reminder of the presence of the Spirit as we worship. You might want to have a bowl of water as a reminder of our baptism. And you might want to grab a mirror. We're not going to have any romper room uh, magic mirror moments, but there will be conversation within the sermon about mirrors. And so it might be a handy reminder for you to have a mirror in your worship space this morning. Uh, one other thing to share with you about our worship. Our liturgy for this morning will be based on the Come Let Us Sing for Joy morning prayer service written by Marty Haugen. This is a worship uh, service that uh, Trinity has used many times in the past, but it's been a while since we sang this liturgy together. You don't need the booklet. Uh, the music will be provided for you here on the screen. But uh, we are so glad to have this uh, worship service, uh, this music, as part of our worship again this morning. So without further ado, let us continue with our worship. Oh God, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Ruler of earth and sea, 
The Old Testament reading is from the 18th chapter of Ezekiel, beginning with the first verse. The Lord's word came to me. What do you mean by this proverb of yours about the land of Israel? When parents eat unripe grapes, the children's teeth suffer. As surely as I live, says the Lord God, no longer will you use this proverb in Israel. All lives are mine. The life of the parent and the life of the child belong to me. Only the one who sins will die. But you say, my Lord's way doesn't measure up. Listen, house of Israel, is it my ways that don't measure up? Isn't it your ways that don't measure up? When those who do the right thing turn from their responsible ways and act maliciously, they will die because of it. For their malicious acts, they will die. And when the wicked turn from their wicked deeds and act justly and responsibly, they will preserve their lives. When they become alarmed and turn away from all their sins, they will surely live. They won't die. Yet the house of Israel says, my Lord's ways don't measure up. Is it my ways that don't measure up? Isn't it your ways that don't measure up, O house of Israel? Therefore, I will judge each of you according to your ways, house of Israel. This is what the Lord God says. Turn, turn away from all your sins. Don't let them be sinful obstacles for you. Abandon all of your repeated sins. Make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why should you die, house of Israel? I most certainly don't want anyone to die. This is what the Lord God says. Change your ways and live. For today's psalm, we sing one of the psalms that's included in the Come Let Us Sing Worship order booklet. We're going to sing Psalm 25. It's set to the tune, How Can I Keep From Singing?, which should be familiar to many of us. There is a refrain that we will all sing together, and the cantor will sing the verses. So let us sing together Psalm 25.
my trust in you alone, your promise and your name. So good and generous is our God, that sinners learn the truth. The epistle reading is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, beginning at the first verse. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort in love, any sharing in the Spirit, any sympathy, complete my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, being united, and agreeing with each other. Don't do anything for selfish purposes, but with humility think of others as better than yourselves. Instead of each person watching out for their own good, watch out for what is better for others. Adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to exploit, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and becoming like human beings. When he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God highly honored him and gave him a name above all names, so that at the name of Jesus everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth might bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my loved ones, just as you always obey me, not just when I am present, but now even more while I am away, carry out your own salvation with fear and trembling. God is the one who enables you both to want and to actually live out his good purposes. This hand mirror belonged to my grandmother, and I inherited it from her last summer. To me, it represents her presence in the cloud of witnesses, that body of believers who have gone before us. I also reflect on the fact that this is what it looks like when I'm preparing for worship. And sometimes it's easy for me to lose sight of the fact that the community of Trinity is with me. That communion of saints is also with me as I prepare for worship and lead worship. Today's Gospel Canticle pulls on both themes. Uh, the idea that God's gifts to us help us understand who we are and where we are and that to which we've been called. It also helps us understand that we're not worshiping in a vacuum, even if we are physically alone in a given moment. In this song on verse 5, I want to draw your attention just to that first phrase, a billion voices in one great song. This helps us reflect both on those who are worshiping with us and also on those saints who have gone before us. Knowing where we belong and to whom we belong, to God within this community, helps us see ourselves and our place in the world a little more accurately. And so let us sing number 878 in the ELW, Soli Deo Gloria.
your spirit chooses the weak and small to sing the new reign of mighty fall. With them may we live your gospel call. Soli Deo Gloria, Soli Deo Gloria. All praise for music, deep gift profound, through hands and voices in holy sound. The songs of David and Mary's praise in wordless splendor and lyric phrase. With all creation, one song we raise. Soli Deo Gloria, Soli Deo Gloria. All praise for Jesus, best gift The Gospel reading is from the 21st chapter of Matthew, beginning at the 23rd verse. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him as he was teaching. They asked, What kind of authority do you have for doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I have a question for you. If you tell me the answer, I'll tell you what kind of authority I have to do these things. Where did John get his authority to baptize? Did he get it from heaven or from humans? They argued among themselves. If we say, from heaven, he'll say to us, then why didn't you believe him? But we can't say, from humans, because we're afraid of this crowd, since everyone thinks John was a prophet. They then replied, we don't know. Jesus also said to them, Neither will I tell you what kind of authority I have to do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. Now he came to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. No, I don't want to, the son replied. But later he changed his mind and went. The father said the same thing to the other son, who replied, Yes, sir. But he didn't go. Which one of these two did his father's will? They said, the first one. Jesus said to them, I assure you that tax collectors and prostitutes are entering God's kingdom ahead of you. For John came to you on the righteous road and you didn't believe him, but tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. Yet even after you saw this, you didn't change your hearts and lives and you didn't believe him. Through saints, prophets, and teachers, God has spoken the word of life to us. And in these last days, God has spoken to us through Jesus the Christ. Jesus said to them, I assure you that tax collectors and prostitutes are entering God's kingdom ahead of you. For John came to you on the righteous road and you didn't believe him but tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. As many of you know, I recently took a trip to Northern California to help my parents and my aunt in uh, packing up and preparing their houses to be put on the market so they can move here and join us in Everett. Now, of course, for that work, we needed boxes, and not just any boxes. We needed good boxes. 
clean and sturdy boxes, but we needed the right box as well. It needed to be the right size because when you're packing books, small boxes are enough. Those boxes get heavy fast. And sometimes we needed bigger boxes for bulkier but light things. And then as each back box got packed, we took it out to the shed so that we could see the progress that we were making in paring their houses down, in getting rid of some of the extra stuff. So at the end of my time there, now all of these boxes that are in the shed needed to be moved to the minivan for me to drive all that stuff up here. And that's where I came into a little bit of a dilemma because my parents' yard is composed of pebbles. So to get all of these heavy boxes from the shed across the yard to the carport required the right tool. Now my parents' neighbor had a dolly that she offered to loan us, but I was worried that with the weight of those boxes, the wheels of the dolly would just dig into the rocks. My parents had a small hand cart and so I thought, well, I can build a handcart superhighway. And so I took uh, lumber and cardboard and rugs, and I built a highway for the handcart to cross the pebbles. As it turned out, the right tool for the job was that dolly. The big wheels on the dolly did just fine in the rocks. So it's important to have the right tool for the job. A mirror can be a tool for a job. Now this little compact that I'm holding, I inherited with my very first desk when I became a social worker in Kansas City. Now men aren't often known for carrying compacts with them, but I discovered having one in my desk can be quite handy. It is a useful tool from time to time, and so each time I've changed dex desks, each time I've left a desk behind, I've taken this compact mirror with me. Now this hand mirror can be a good tool for me because I live alone, and so sometimes if I need to inspect a more hidden spot, this hand mirror is quite the useful tool. As I was driving the big minivan from Northern California back up here to Everett, I was grateful that the minivan is equipped with side mirrors. Those side mirrors were important tools for my drive. There was one time where I passed an SUV and when I got safely past the SUV, I started to merge back into the lane and I looked in the side mirror and another car had passed the SUV on the right and they were already merged into the spot that I was moving into. And I saw that because of this side mirror. So a mirror can indeed be a very useful tool for uh, the work that is needed. But like having the wrong box or the wrong cart, it's not enough to have just any mirror. We have to have the right mirror for the job. This little compact would have done me absolutely no good when I was driving the minivan. So we have to have the right tool and we have to use it correctly. In our scripture readings for today, you'll hear several different ways that our scripture readings are offering themselves to us as mirrors. These scripture readings can help us to see ourselves more accurately. They can help us to see God more accurately. We can even, through these scripture readings today, to see the world around us and our place in the world more accurately. We might even be able to see some dangers and some opportunities through
through our scripture readings for today. But like with any other tool, we want to be careful in how we use these scripture readings this morning. So let's start with Philippians, especially verse 3 in our reading for today. With humility, think of others as better than yourselves. Did that verse catch your attention as Delvin was reading it for us? This passage, this uh, section of verse 3 in particular, can be an especially hard word for people who have experienced bullying or for members of any marginalized community who have had their full humanity challenged, or for anyone who has repeatedly been told that they are worthless, that they are less valuable than any other human being. For people who have heard these words diminishing their uh, humanity, diminishing their self-worth, these words from verse 3 can be a particular hard word to hear. But if we just pull out verse 3 from this passage and use it in isolation, it's sort of like using not a hand mirror, but a funhouse mirror. There's still a reflection, but it's all distorted. And so we want to keep this verse 3 connected with the passage where Paul uses it. And Paul uses this verse 3 as an introduction to what was likely an early Christian hymn about Jesus Christ. This early Christian hymn talks about how Christ humbled himself, how Christ acted as a servant, how Christ willingly took on the restrictions of being human. And so... Paul uses this early Christian hymn as a way of helping the church in Philippi. You see, Paul is proclaiming to the church in Philippi during a time of discord, during a time of controversy within that community. And so he uses this hymn, this early Christian hymn, as a tool, a way of helping that community to remember, to remember Jesus to remember that they should be like Jesus. So he's inviting them to see themselves as people who serve one another, as people who seek the common good. And so that helps us to hear that verse in its context. And in thinking about how this passage from Philippians can be a tool for us today, I wonder, does our world show signs of needing the invitation to seek the common good, of not serving our own selfish interests? Can this passage help us as a tool to see ourselves and the world around us better? I think that it can. And now let's look at the passage from Ezekiel. It also has a challenge for us, especially the part where it sounds like Ezekiel is giving some if-then statements, that if you sin, then you're going to die. And if you act right, you're going to live. And making that uh, explicit connection sounds troublesome to us. And then there's that strange saying about grapes. What on earth is Ezekiel doing with this passage about uh, eating grapes? Well, it's important to remember that Ezekiel was a prophet who was responding to the situation of his nation at that time. And Ezekiel was hearing from the people in his nation that they were responding to the present troubles around them, to the injustice that was present in their way of life, by saying, these present troubles, they're not our fault. God is punishing us for the prior generation's sins. And that's what that saying about the grapes means. So the, past, the saying about grapes was saying that the parent eats the sour grapes, but it's the children whose teeth are set at, at, on edge. So the parent does the behavior, 
and it's the children who receive the consequence. So the teeth on edge from the parents eating the sour grapes. And there's biblical support for this mindset that the future generations receive the punishment for the parents' behaviors. Both Exodus 34 and Deuteronomy 5 say that God will punish into the third and fourth generation. So that's what Ezekiel is responding to. But Ezekiel challenges his nation's persecution complex. He tells his people, no, God is not punishing you for the sins of prior generations. God is asking you to turn from the injustice that you are perpetrating. And it's also helpful, I think, to remember that this is within a mindset of understanding God's law in a particular way. For the people of Ezekiel's time, they understood that the law was not a way that God punishes people, but the law was the way that God communicated God's intentions for humanity. The law was God's gift to provide structure to humankind so that humankind could flourish and so that all of creation could flourish. When one lived within the constraints of the law, that was life because that was living within God's intentions. So the law equaled life. Following the law meant being fully alive. And so the flip side of that is that when we are outside of the law, when we act in sin, we are pulling ourselves away from God. We're pulling ourselves away from the presence of life which means death. And so that equation uh, that sounds so troublesome to us, um, I think with that mindset, it helps us understand that better, that the law is life, and to separate from the law is death. So seeing Ezekiel as a tool available to us for this morning, does our world need to see more clearly our own complicity in injustice, in destructive actions that are happening within the world that are outside of God's intentions for humankind and for the creation. I think that it does. Now let's turn to Matthew's gospel for us this morning. Now in this passage, it's like the chief priests and the elders are taking the mirror but not holding it in front of themselves. They're holding it in front of Jesus. And they're saying to Jesus, just who do you see? Who do you think you are? By whose authority are you doing these things? And Jesus takes their mirror and flips it around and asks them, who all do you see? Not just do you see yourselves in this mirror, but who else is behind you, is with you, is beside you, who is around you as you look in this mirror? Because the chief priests and the elders, it's as if they saw themselves certainly at the front of God's line, but perhaps they only saw themselves as being in God's line, the only ones that God favored. And so Jesus tells them a parable to help them see God's presence more clearly. That those that the chief priests and elders thought were outside the scope of God's love were not only loved by God, but those people were in fact responding to God's invitations. Their lives reflected God's influence on them, but the religious authorities couldn't see those signs. So again and again today, we have heard God calling us to pick up our mirrors, to see ourselves as God sees us, to see the world as God sees it, to see where we don't match up to God's intentions for us, and to see where God is inviting us to turn toward God. So, 
Let's give Ezekiel the last word this morning in his proclamation of God's call. I most certainly don't want anyone to die. This is what the Lord God says. Change your ways and live. Thanks be to God. Amen. Today we will meditate on the words of our hymn of the day by first hearing the words by themselves and then by hearing the melody to which it's set by itself. If you would like to follow along with either the words or the melody, you can find it in the ELW hymnal number 497, Strengthen for Service Lord. Strengthen for service, Lord, the hands that holy things have taken. And let the ears that heard your word to falsehood never waken. The tongues that sang your holy name now purge of all deception. Keep bright the eyes that saw your love and sharpen their perception. And may the feet that walked your courts be never lured to wander, but lead the faithful nourished here to journey on in splendor. Oh, 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 God of endless blessings, we thank you for bringing us safely into this new day. 
Give us compassion and courage that all we do this day might be a faithful and joyous offering to you, that we might serve you and all your children in loving stewardship of your wondrous creation. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray. alone in my apartment right now, but the song that we are about to sing together to close our worship represents a whole cloud of witnesses, people who have kept me honest, people who have cheered me on, people through whom the Holy Spirit has worked to give me a clearer understanding of who I really am and how I really fit in the world and how I need to look at those around me. We are going to be singing a brand new song. It's called Humility, Honesty, and Love, and it's based in our reading from Philippians 2 today. We will have indications on the screen of when the cantor is singing and when the whole congregation is singing. I think you'll catch on pretty quickly. So let us sing together our closing hymn, Humility, Honesty, and Love.
Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, for our redemption you sent Jesus Christ, your Son, into the midst of your creation as word and witness, sacrifice and Savior. Help us all to take up our own cross each day and follow his example as faithful and compassionate servants. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Receive the blessing. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and evermore. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. See you